The Art of War by Sun Tzu Book Summary Chapter 1, Laying Plans Sun Tzu regarded the careful examination of military strategy as being of the utmost significance. Learning about battle was necessary because it may determine whether or not a nation lives or dies. This made the subject very significant. This chapter serves as an introduction to the topics that will be covered in the remaining chapters of this book by Sun Tzu. He discusses the five most important aspects of war, which are moral impact, weather, topography, command, and ideology. Each of these topics is covered in further depth in subsequent chapters of the book. When taken into consideration as a whole, these five aspects will work together to assist you in formulating a pre-conflict strategy. To put it another way, these considerations are essential to the execution of your strategy. Moral Influence The level of faith that the individuals the leader's subordinates have in them is the first aspect to consider. In the end, this confidence will determine whether or not the people are willing to put up with the strains of war. In addition, the likelihood of success in waging war is closely correlated with this propensity to engage in combat. The climate and the topography. When taking these two aspects into consideration, leaders are tasked with determining whether or not it will be challenging for their men to march over the terrain. It is your responsibility as a leader to make this evaluation in order to gain a better understanding of the state in which your troops will arrive before attacking the enemy. Command and Spiritual Guidance The evaluation of command that is done by a leader is related to the attributes that the leader possesses. More specifically, how qualified he is to order the troops and of confidence that these instructions would be followed accurately by the troops. A leader needs to project command by exhibiting vital attributes including wisdom, sincerity, humanism, courage, and strictness. This is necessary for a leader to do. Lastly, the philosophy of a leader pertains to the organization, control, and distribution of appropriate ranks within the army, as well as the regulation of supply channels and the provision of products that are utilized by the army. If you are able to optimize these five criteria, then your chances of winning a war are much higher than those of a significantly larger force that does not have these factors. As a result, the planning that occurs before the engagement is quite important. In addition, Sun Tzu inverts his concept of strategic planning. He advises that you should gather as much information as possible about your adversary while simultaneously concealing your own genuine condition from them. If they are unable to accurately assess your capabilities, it will be far more difficult for them to prevail in combat. Those who master them win, those who do not are defeated. Sun Tzu Before we continue to Chapter 2, if you like my content, please be sure to subscribe so I can produce more chapter summaries about books like these so you don't have to read them yourself. Chapter 2, Waging War when an army is deployed into war, it is imperative that they act quickly and decisively in order to succeed. Even though this chapter is full of very particular information, such as the quantity of horses and people that should be brought into combat, the most essential takeaway message is that there is a significant emphasis placed on how swiftly one should act. In addition, there is no way to emerge victorious if adequate planning and organization have not been done in advance. This includes having a comprehensive awareness of your forces and resources so that you never need to send for additional provisions. In doing so, you refrain from making any changes to the strategy that you have meticulously worked out. The most effective commanders are those who have a thorough understanding of their troops and who carefully monitor their mental and physical states. Before going into battle, generals have to make certain that a number of considerations have been taken into account. In that case, defeat is a foregone conclusion because of a lack of decisive speed, due to 1. Hunger 2. Thirst 3. Attachment to loot Outrage caused by a wrongdoing When conducting military operations, in addition to ensuring that these aspects have been taken into consideration, leaders need to keep in mind that both human lives and financial resources are on the line. As a result, you should never behave in a way that is seen to be risky. Your army will suffer from the psychological effects of your recklessness, which will result in your army becoming fatigued and your resources becoming depleted. During times of war, it is important to make the most of what you have. Do not burn food that you can eat, do not destroy resources that you can use, and do not kill soldiers that have the potential to either provide you information or join your ranks. Chapter 3, Attack by Strategy If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Sun Tzu When it comes to winning a battle, it is not about how much havoc you cause that matters. Instead, the purpose of war is to dominate and dominate over one's adversary. 
Only with meticulous preparation is it possible to achieve a triumph of this kind. The following is a list of strategies that Sun Tzu recommends using during battle, in the order of their effectiveness. 1. Target the enemy's plans and strategies for attack. 2. Create space between the adversary and his allies. 3. Engage the army in combat. When all other options have been exhausted, you should launch an assault on the opposing army. In light of this, Sun Tzu emphasizes the significance of maintaining self-control and avoiding rash actions while under siege. He uses the example of Emperor Tai Wu to illustrate his idea and provide support for it. Tai Wu was in command of 100,000 soldiers. Tai Wu, an emperor at the time, is said to have approached the Sun General Sang Chi with a request for some wine. On the other hand, he received a container full of urine as his delivery. Because Tai Wu was so enraged, he launched an assault on the city straight away. After a period of 30 days, more than half of Tai Wu's army had perished. It is essential for a leader to maintain composure in spite of the fact that they may be experiencing intense feelings. The leader is responsible for keeping their own feelings as well as those of their followers under control at all times. Additionally, Sun Tzu outlines five conditions that must be met before success can be anticipated. 1. Let's say the leader is aware of everything there is to know about the opposing force, as well as everything there is to know about himself and his own forces. With this information, the leader will be able to determine when it is appropriate to advance and when it is appropriate to retreat. 2. If the leader is capable of making effective use of both a small and a large number of troops. 3. If the leader is capable of making the ranks work together toward a common goal. 4. If the leader is able to maintain their composure even when the followers around them are finding it difficult to do so. 5. If the leader is aware that the actions he is making should violate his sovereign rights, then he should never let that happen. Additional advice offered by Sun Tzu is as follows. 1. If your forces are much more numerous than those of the opponent, you should attempt to encircle the enemy. 2. You should launch an assault on your adversary if you have five times more troops than they have. 3. If you have twice as many resources as your opponent, you should split them up and battle them in different groups. 4. If your adversary is more numerous than you, you should take cover. 5. In addition, you need to get away if they are much more numerous than you are. 6. You need a general who can act independently and make choices without interference from those in higher positions. Chapter 4. Tactical Dispositions The experts in defense conceal themselves, those skilled in attack move as from above. Thus they are capable of protecting themselves and gaining victory. Sun Tzu. In his work, Sun Tzu makes a crucial distinction between defensive and offensive strategies. To be more specific, the most important distinction is between things that the general can control, such as himself and his troops, and things that are outside of his control, the opposing general and his troops. As the head of the group, you are responsible for ensuring that everyone's egos are in control. Imagine that your team has won an easy and unsurprising victory over an opponent that was plainly in a stronger position than they were. In that situation, you need to keep in mind that this victory is not a reflection of your level of competence. In addition, the true factors that led to a victory are not always easy to decipher. For instance, triumphs earned prior to the initial clash of armies are examples of hidden realities that are often only seen when a fight actually commences. When prospects for victory do present themselves, a shrewd commander will have done their homework and be well prepared to seize them. They do not assume anything to be true. Sun Tzu is credited with introducing Taoism to the world as an indication of how one's forces might be forged into a unit that is capable of behaving as if it were an unavoidable force of nature. Additionally, he discussed aspects of warfare, including 1. Measurement of space 2. Estimation of quantities 3. Calculations 4. Comparisons 5. Chances of victory A victorious army wins its victories before seeking battle, an army destined to defeat fights in the hope of winning. Sun Tzu Chapter 5. Use of Energy as a leader, one of your primary responsibilities is to ensure that the units you command are well organized and efficient. You may effectively manage your individual troops so that they function as a unified force if you do it the right way. This cohesiveness has the potential to be the deciding element in whether or not you prevail against an opponent with a less tightly controlled environment. The adoption of a pyramid of command is something that Sun Tzu encourages. Your team is constructed from the ground up, beginning with the base, which should consist of individual warriors. The next step is to advance through each level by producing units that are ever more powerful. 
Examples of this include a pair, a trio, a squad, a section, a platoon, a company, a battalion, a regiment, a group, a brigade, and an army. At each level, you should incorporate a commander who is responsible for subordinating himself to his superiors and exercising authority over his subordinates. Even if your forces are dispersed and unable to communicate with one another, proper organization can still help them comprehend whether they should be marching or retiring and when they should be doing either. According to Sun Tzu, the key to successfully managing an extraordinary force is to understand that while the components of the force, such as the well-organized and methodical organization of an army, are limited, the conceivable combinations of those components are virtually endless. As an illustration of these infinite permutations, Sun Tzu discusses how one may make an infinite number of configurations using only five musical notes or five primary colors. This serves as an excellent illustration of these boundless variants. An advantage can be attained by luring or enticing the adversary into making a dangerous attack on themselves. A skillful general may control the movements of his enemy in this way, preventing himself from being influenced by the movements of his enemy. Chapter 6. Weak Points and Strong Appear weak when you are strong, and strong when you are weak. Sun Tzu Sun Tzu held the belief that effective commanders might engineer circumstances in which the adversary is compelled to engage in combat. They accomplish this by giving the leaders of the opposition the impression that victory will come easily to them. Because of the opposition's inflated sense of self-assurance, this will force them into a position from which they are unable to retreat. In addition to this, it is highly likely that they will not be in a strong position to protect themselves. The most effective strategy for luring the adversary into an ambush is to conceal what appears to be a way out of the situation. On the other hand, in actuality, you will have controlled this path so that you could capture captives and secure supplies. The benefit of having time to recuperate and fully examine the best positions for their battalions goes to the army that arrives at the battlefield first. If a general chooses to withhold information about the specifics of his intentions from his opponent, the latter may be forced to focus their efforts on fortifying one sector at the expense of leaving another area open to attack. One method to ensure victory is to force the adversary to make fortification attempts in every possible direction. Because of this, the adversary will have their resources dispersed across multiple positions, making it impossible for any one of those positions to withstand an assault. Chapter 7. Maneuvering. Nothing is more difficult than the art of maneuver. Sun Tzu. The process of issuing commands and orders to members of a physical army is referred to as maneuvering. When you order your army to march for 30 miles, you will suffer losses in personnel due to a variety of causes. There is a balance to be struck between pushing them to their limits in order to obtain an edge and pushing them beyond their limits. Sun Tzu recommends a tricky strategy that entails claiming to be on an aimless route when, in reality, you are actually on a direct and concentrated road. Sun Tzu wrote this strategy in the 5th century BC. This strategy is meant to throw off the opponent while simultaneously instructing the lower-ranking members of your army on how to follow instructions that are frequently altered. Although it has the potential to be very powerful, this strategy should only be utilized by leaders who have a great deal of expertise. There's a story about Sun Tzu where he gets challenged to build an army out of concubines, and he accepts the task. This appeared to be difficult for a variety of obvious reasons. He would issue an order, after which they would chuckle and go about their business. Then, in an effort to restore order, he had two of the king's most beloved concubines put to death. After that, everybody paid attention and acted exactly like they were told to. This tale demonstrates that teaching your army to maneuver effectively might be one of the most difficult jobs for a commander to undertake. As a result, it's possible that some challenging choices will need to be made in order to facilitate navigating. In addition, Sun Tzu offers detailed instructions on how to maneuver. To begin, you should emphasize to the members of your army that splitting up should only be done when it is absolutely required. It is in everyone's best interest to make sure that all of the troops arrive at the battleground at the same time and in good condition. In addition, you want your army to arrive at the battleground before the army of the enemy. Sun Tzu referred to this proximity in time and proximity to one another as an ideal location. Chapter 8. Variation of Tactics Sometimes the circumstances require a new approach to take, as well as a different choice. There are certain cities that you should refrain from attacking there are certain routes that you ought not to take. As you prepare, you realize that certain decisions could have disastrous consequences. 
Every one of these strategy choices was made by the general, and there are five key ways in which the general could be wrong about his tactic choices. Being careless and lacking patience is a surefire way to bring about disaster. Fear and cowardice are the two main factors that lead to eventual capture. A quick temper makes a person more susceptible to being baited and provoked. Someone who holds herself to a high level of honor may be more vulnerable and sensitive to feelings of shame. An excessive amount of compassion for the soldiers could cause a general to second-guess his judgments and worry about the soldiers rather than concentrating solely on achieving victory. According to Sun Tzu, one of these five flaws is always to blame any time an army is destroyed or a leader is eliminated from the battlefield. Chapter 9. The Army on the March when confronted by an approaching foe, Sun Tzu emphasizes the significance of well-disciplined marches as well as the proper positioning of forces. When he is detailing the best ways to address a problem, he takes into account both the weather and the topographical conditions. For instance, he suggests making use of the locations of the sun not just in relation to the time of day, but also in relation to rivers, mountains, salt marshes, and level plain. This is something that Sun Tzu suggests doing because there was a precedent for it during his time. Because he was willing to take advantage of certain encampments, the Yellow Emperor had been successful in his conquest of four sovereign states. Sun Tzu also suggests making the most of adverse climatic or topographical situations to your advantage. Take for instance the fact that it is cloudy outside and there are a number of rivers in front of you. If this is the case, your objective should be to drive the enemy army back into this area where they will be forced to engage in combat. Chapter 10. Classification of Terrain Sun Tzu offers advice to leaders on how they should understand their terrain and the rewards of fighting on different terrains in his book The Art of War. Terrain that is accessible means that it is easy for everyone to go through. Imagine that you have the ability to secure high ground before the enemy comes and that you have enough supplies to last. If that is the case, then you are in a very strong position to succeed. If your adversary is on higher ground than you are, you should fall back and force them to give up their advantages if they still want to pursue the objective. Ground that is entangled makes it simple to advance and acquire fresh territory. On the other hand, going backwards or retreating will be a challenging proposition. Before continuing your advance in this country, you should make sure that your opponent is weak. There is a deadlock, and neither side appears to have an advantage. In this particular scenario, Sun Tzu advises withdrawing from the conflict and allowing the adversary to progress into this area. You will then be in a position to strike with an advantage. Enclosed denotes a confined space with extremely few available choices. You will have the ability to obstruct their path or ambush them if you get to this area first. If the enemy possesses a gap like this, you shouldn't advance until you are certain that they are inadequately defending it. Only then should you try to take it. In addition, the hazards that are inherent in a general's weakness or hesitation have just as much of an influence on the readiness of men to fight as the conditions of the terrain on which a war is fought. This is true for each and every sub-commander and officer in relation to the troops they are responsible for commanding. Chapter 11, The Nine Situations Sun Tzu quickly walks through descriptions of nine various ground sorts on which a war may take place, ranging from the easiest to the most desperate, along with strategies on how to handle each of these varied types of terrain. Sun Tzu suggests that you should never engage the adversary on the following types of land, as there is very little to be gained by doing so. 1. Dispersive ground within one's own area, also known as dispersive terrain. 2. Frontier ground refers to making a limited incursion into the territory of the enemy. 3. Key ground the most important ground, impartial or mutually beneficial. It may be to the advantage of a leader to continue the battle if he or she is able to maintain their formations together. 4. Communicating ground, land that has been enlarged and made level in order to house fortifications. Engaging on the following activities can result in you gaining supporters and resources as a leader. 5. Focal ground When you are surrounded by three other states, you are in a focal ground situation. However, there is a possibility that allies will not be reliable in the long run. 6. Serious ground Covering serious ground requires making a significant advance into the territory controlled by the adversary. As a result, an important opportunity to acquire convicts and resources. On the other hand, it is tough to back out of this situation. As a result, you have to make certain that there is a consistent flow of provisions. If this is the case, you should steer clear of the following types of ground. 7. Difficult ground This is not the type of terrain in which you want to be engaged in combat. 
They consist of cliffs, mountains, bogs, and swift-moving rivers, among other natural features. 8. Encircled ground is a sort of ground that is characterized by being squeezed by opposing forces as well as rugged terrain. 9. Death ground The only way for the army to prevail here is to fight out of desperation. This area presents the toughest challenge to an army's existing order and discipline on the inside. Chapter 12. The Attack by Fire Sun Tzu discusses a variety of military tactics and techniques. Fire, on the other hand, is among the most potent of all weapons. He describes in detail the following five methods that one can make use of fire in times of conflict. 1. Burning enemy soldiers. 2. Destroying any materials that have a static charge. 3. Causing the destruction of their supplies while they are still being transported. 4. Destroying their arsenal as well as their ammunition. 5. Cutting off all lines of contact and producing complete mayhem. These techniques are extremely sensitive to variations in temperature, humidity, wind speed and direction, and air pressure. They recommend that all of the different kinds of equipment for this kind of attack should be meticulously thought out and placed a good deal in advance so that adjustments can be made to fit shifting environmental conditions. For instance, if your fire assault is successful, you should capitalize on the situation by instantly switching to a physical strike. When the intensity of the flames is at its greatest, launch an attack. Do not sit around and wait for the fire to die down. When starting fires, make sure you are facing upwind, and keep in mind that fires started at night are likely to go out more quickly than fires started during the day. Chapter 13. The Use of Spies Native agents are individuals who are from the country of the adversary, whereas inside agents are those who are already embedded within the organization of the opposing army. Anyone holding a grudge may be open to flattery, generous bribery, or persuasion by an emotional or logical appeal when these two types of agent are present. These kinds of agents are able to transmit important information. Double agents are spies dispatched by the enemy that can be bought off with bribes and then employed to pass on false information to the adversary. If you have a comprehensive understanding of the type of person a double agent is, you will be able to determine the kind of inducement that has the best chance of succeeding in winning him over. On the other hand, expendable agents are individuals who are tasked with the responsibility of feeding the enemy information that is purposefully false and is leaked to them. These operatives are disposable because if they are discovered participating in the deceit, they will be put to death. Living agents, on the other hand, are those that report back with information that is just intended for the general's ears. With this information, one can obtain an advantage over the adversary and strengthen their position. According to Sun Tzu, those who acquire knowledge should be given the highest pay and treated with the utmost respect since gaining wisdom is essential to achieving victory, particularly a victory that does not include the use of force. Every move that a general makes is based on this intelligence, 